most effective evangelist in the world would take about maybe 40 minutes to deal with this. And then I'm going to tell you the story of the prodigal son. Who is the most effective evangelist in the world? So give me names of people you think they are really good. Billy Graham. Doug Bachelor. Mark Finley. All right. Alejandro Boyan, Carlton Berg, all of those people. How people come to the Lord. Have you ever thought about this? How people find Jesus. Well, I'm going to give you some categories. Somebody in 1969 thought about this. And he made a survey and asked people, and I'm going to put it down for you and see uh, if you could guess the right answer. A special needs, like you have divorce, crisis in your life, you run out of money, uh, you have major illness, and then you seek the Lord. Walk in, the people of this area say, well, this is the closest church to us, that's the one we're going to go to. The pastor, visitation, that's what Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons do. Uh, Sabbath school, evangelistic meeting, that's what you mentioned, Billy Graham and Mark Finley and all of those people. Church programs, which would be uh, cooking classes. I notice you are going to have one coming up soon. Uh, it could be uh, concerts, any kind of program that your church sponsor. So let's look at this. Special need. What percentage of people come to the Lord as a result of special needs? Five percent? That's very low. Twenty percent. Twenty-five. Forty. Seventy percent. You know what? I think we should stop and pray. Father in heaven, it's really uh, wonderful that uh, we could gather together this afternoon like we read in the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to prayer, to Bible study. And, and that's what we're doing right now. We're devoting ourselves to these things. Help us to gain something that will impact us the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's move into, uh, I don't know what happened here. Oh, give me one second. Okay. I, okay, the second one. Walk-in. What percentage of people come to the Lord as a result of walk-in? One percent. All right. The pastor, that has to be very high. No. Zero. Zero. One. I'm telling you, that's terrible. So unfair. So unfair. Visitation. High. Well, give me a percentage. Twenty-five. No, you are the one who said 60%. Okay, Sabbath school. 10. 10. Ten. Five, it went down. Evangelistic meetings. 75. 75. Yeah. 40. So both of you are saying it's high. The lowest I got 40, the highest is 70. Church programs. 80%. Every figure you gave me is wrong. <laughs> Everyone. Okay, let's see. Special needs, one to two percent. One to two. Walk in, two to three percent. There was somebody very close to that, but they said one, and this is double that. <laughs> the pastor was five to six percent. So it's a little bit better than what we thought. <laughs> uh, visitation, 1 to 2 percent. Sabbath school, 4 to 5 percent. Evangelistic meetings, 5 percent. And church programs, 3 to 4 percent. Does that make sense to you? You're, you're challenging this, right? You are. You don't believe it. Well, it's sure it's factual. But, but how can it be factual when you're challenging it? 
I left that out. Uh, you think so? Friends and relatives. 75 to 90. Uh, do you mind if you come over here and help me? No, no, I want you to help me. Yeah. Can you come over here and help me? You count everybody on this side. You count everybody on this side. Count. That's exactly what I came up with. You, 35. Ah, yeah, how many here? 35? Well, uh, I got 38. 38. So, with me and you, that makes it 40, and 35 is what? 75, 75 people. Okay. We're going to, you could go ahead and sit down. So, we got 75, correct? Would you like to keep uh, a record for us? Who would like to keep a record? <laughs> Uh, would you like to keep a record for us? You have a piece of paper, you have your bulletin. Okay. If the primary influence in your conversion experience, the primary influence is a special needs, or oh, they are over there. Raise your hand. I'm sorry. So what was it? Did you have any connection with the church? Okay, so uh, half a point for her. <laughs> because she grew up in the church, but she drifted away from God. No, no, I didn't, I didn't grow up Adventist. No, my sister became Adventist in the 30s or 40s. We were Catholic, but we were raised Adventist. Okay. Yeah. So I think she was. We'll give her one. <laughs> now, let me see if there's anybody else. Because I, I don't know if I got everybody. I got one. Nothing on this side. Walk in. How many of you just wandered into the Adventist church? One? Huh? Okay, one and one. Pastor. Or oh, two walking, two walking. Which, by the way, is very consistent with this. The walking is double the special needs. We got two and one. Yeah. The pastor. Somebody should raise their hands so we can justify our salaries. <laughs> this, this is not an indication of our new job at all. You just started. <laughs> Brand new. So zero for the pastor. Visitation. Somebody knocked on your door. You don't know them. Zero. Sabbath school. Zero. Evangelistic meetings. Uh, one, two, three, four. Well, you are we're doubling on you. Okay, four for evangelistic meeting. Church programs. Zero. Church program. Somebody raise their hands? <laughs> oh, next category. Friends and relatives, mom and dad, look at that. Look around you. Look around you, please. So let me ask you the question one more time. Who is the most effective evangelist in the world? <laughs> you are, not Mark Finley. It's amazing. The most effective evangelist in the world is every one of us. Amen. And that is the way God wants it to be. Remember when Jesus healed somebody, what did he say to them? Go. Go, tell your family what happened to you. 
We did the same thing in the Adventist church. Uh, we, we modified this. In this one, they said, give us one factor. But we felt many of us come to the Lord as a result of multiple factors. Like maybe you grew up in the church, but uh, maybe an evangelistic meeting or school or a pastor. So here is the way it came in the Adventist church. Brought up in an Adventist home, 60%. Friend and relatives, 60%. Uh, Bible study in my home, 34%. If you add one, two, and four, it comes to 77%. And that's exactly what this one is. 77%. There are some differences. Do you see public evangelistic meeting is 36%? Do you see that? Do you see what it is here in the evangelical study? Is 5%? Why such a big difference? Prophecy. Prophecy. It's, it's part of it. You are right. We are the only church that offer an interpretation for prophecy. And people who like prophecy will come to these things. That's one reason. What is another reason? Let's say it in a different way. We are the only one who does it on a regular basis. Yeah. No, not every 24. But evangelistic meeting, regular, that's what we're talking about, public evangelistic meeting. No, the television is in a different category. 20% come to the Lord as a result of television and radio. That's toward the bottom. Uh, but uh, almost every Adventist church will have some kind of an evangelistic meeting from time to time. That's what we're talking about. I don't know if any other church does it. They, they do it, but not to the extent we do it. And they, they don't cover... Uh, prophecy, they cover just Christ and some doctor. That's what they do most of the time. Yeah. Uh, under others, number one under others was my wife. <laughs> my wife was six times higher than my husband. Hmm. Wow. Which shows you that women are a lot more effective in evangelism than men. Hmm. That's true. Uh, based on this and also based on that uh, the people who said the greatest influence in their conversion experience was their moms was 59%. But those who said my dad was 33%. That's more than double. Now it could be because historically the mother stayed in the house. That's of course not the same today. But of course. There is another factor, and that is, I think women tend to be more relational and they go deeper in their relationship than men. And evangelism really has a lot to do with the relationship. And there, uh, number two under others was my teacher, which was a mistake on my side. I should have put that in a separate category like schools. Number three was my pathfinder. So tell me what is the common denominator of my wife, my teacher, and my pathfinder. There's one common denominator. No, no. Something much higher than education. Relationship. Relationship is really the most important factor in doing evangelism. Building that wonderful relationship with other people. Here is the other thing we discover from this study. By the way, if you want more details, it's in the book, The Big Four. There's a whole chapter on this. But the thing we discover is no matter how you come to the Lord, no matter any method, 
in the first six months, if you have three friends or less, the probability of leaving the church is 80%. But if you have seven or more friends, the probability of staying in the church is 80%. Friends in the church. That's a swing of 160%. It's friends who bring us to the Lord, and it's friends who keep us in the Lord. Which shows how important the role of every one of us. I'm just going to share with you three stories about this. Uh, I was in a, a Brazilian church in Dallas. And uh, they combined a bunch of these churches. And uh, there were maybe 200 people in the afternoon. And I was talking to them about something similar to this. And right here in the front, there were two young girls and a young boy. And during the break, I went to them. And I asked the first one, I said, what's your name? She said, uh, she is Nora. She's originally, her parents originally were from Brazil, but she was born here. The girl next to her, her name is Madeline. Her parents came from Mexico. And the brother of Madeline, Jose, and I, I said to them, why are you sitting here? There is a program for the kids. And they said, no, we would like to know how to be effective in winning other people for Jesus. Three, uh, Nora was 12, and the other two, I think Jose was like 14, and his sister was 10. So I said, uh, have you done anything like that before? And Nora said, yes. She said, her Sabbath school teacher asked them to bring somebody to Sabbath school. And uh, she said uh, she was riding the bus to go to school. She was living in a big apartment complex. And Madeline was sitting by herself. And when she got on the bus, Nora thought about what her Sabbath school teacher said to her. And she felt impressed by God to go and sit beside Madeline. So she went and sat beside her. They started talking with each other. And then she invited her to Sabbath school. And uh, she said, uh, how do I get to Sabbath school? Well, she said, my mom and dad will come and pick you up. So she started to go to Sabbath school. She went for a few weeks. She liked it so much, she invited her brother to go to Sabbath school. And then they invited the parents. And the Sabbath before mine, the whole family, four of them got baptized. And all of that because a young girl was led by God to sit beside another young girl and invite her to Sabbath school. And if you are a Sabbath school teacher, you never know the influence you have. And you never know the impact when you challenge those kids of what they would do. Our pastor, a couple of years ago, stood up in church and he said, we send a flyer to the community. And uh, uh, we asked people if they wanted to study the Bible and we got a bunch of cards back. We have taken care of most of them, but I still have five more. If you are interested in giving a Bible study, come to me and I will give you a card. If you don't know how to do it, I will teach you how. So I went and picked up one of them. And uh, it turned out to be a woman. So I decided to study with her at the church, not in her home. And eventually this woman got baptized. But I'm in the habit of visiting the people I baptized the day after their baptism. So I went to visit with her at her home. And very nice home, very, very nice. And uh, I go inside and there are pictures of her husband fishing everywhere. He was the most avid fisherman I ever have seen in my life. He had a nice boat, sonar, radar, he had entered tournaments, and you see all of these big fish he has caught. So I said in my heart, if I'm ever going to win this guy for Jesus, 
I have to learn about fishing. <laughs> I don't know anything about fishing. So I went to my most trusted source in the world, Google. <laughs> and I Googled how to fish. And I downloaded a bunch of articles. And I read them. And I went the following week and I shared with this guy my vast knowledge about fishing. He was impressed. <laughs> Every week, I'm doing the same. And uh, one day I said to him, can I go fishing with you? Oh, he said, please. Can, I, can my son come with us? He said, yes, bring your son. On Sunday, we went fishing. We had a wonderful time. During the week, <coughs> every day I'm praying. I said, Lord, I don't know how to reach this guy's heart for Jesus. But open an opportunity for me. We went fishing for five hours. We had a great time. At the end of the day, we came back. My son caught two big ones. I caught seven of the biggest fish you could ever see. <laughs> he didn't get any. Nothing. He was so exasperated, so upset. He looked at me and he said, you told me you never have fished before. And yet you got seven and I didn't get any. How did you do it? I said, I prayed about it. He said, teach me about prayer. And eventually, I had the privilege of baptizing this man. Friends, I want to tell you, in order to reach people for Jesus, sometimes you might have to get out of your comfort zone. And you might have to learn about fishing, or auto mechanic, or crocheting, or cooking, to connect with. I'd like you to turn to somebody next to you and tell them what you learned from this presentation. I have a wonderful story at the end. You don't want to miss that. But I'd just like you to share with somebody next to you what you learned. Mm -hmm. That God will lead you to somebody. Yes. Just keep praying about it every day. I, I pray for five baptisms every year. And the Lord never fails. Since I have been at the seminary, the highest number has been 37, and the lowest is five. Is the lowest actually seven? So I just pray a lot about it. Number two, I have evangelistic or ministry eyes. Like when I went to this house, I saw the pictures of the fishing. I said, "That's that's what it is." <laughs> Build a relationship with people. Get to know your neighbors, co-workers. That's how you want people for Jesus. Share your testimony. Doesn't have to be spectacular. Doesn't have to be about doctrine. Just share with them what Jesus has done for you. And stay with them for the long haul. I didn't know any of this stuff. I went to my first church in Spokane Valley. And uh, I arrived Friday afternoon, and I stayed with the associate pastor that was going to go to the seminary. I was replacing him. And the following day, they introduced me to the church. And then at the end of the worship service, we had two worship services at the end of the second one, a woman came to me, and she said, tomorrow, we're starting vacation Bible school. And she said, we have a lot of kids. We're going to start one in the morning and one in the evening. And you are going to be the devotional speaker for both of them. And you're going to be preaching next week for three services. Two in the morning and one in the evening. And she said, thank you so much for accepting this challenge. God bless you. Well, I did the best I can. At the end of the second service the following week, another woman came to me. And she said, I am from California. I came here to visit with my sister. My sister had two kids who are uh, vacation Bible school age. I invited them to come. 
but they couldn't come because of soccer practice. But I know my sister is really interested. Would you please go and visit with her? So here's what happened. Uh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll go back and forth. The Vacation Bible School leader, her name was Sally. These are actual names of people. And the lady who was interested is Laura. So we went and visited with Laura. Laura was very interested. Very. So Sally and Laura started the Bible study right away. And Laura invited Charles and Kim, the two kids who were supposed to come to Vacation Bible School and they didn't come. They were very interested. Laura had a daughter by the name of Sue who was living in the basement with a boyfriend by the name of Ty. So Laura took me down the stairs and asked Ty and Sue to study the Bible with me. They said, we're not interested. We have no interest in that area. She said, look, you either study the Bible with Pastor Joe or I'm kicking you out on the street. <laughs> so I got a Bible study with two people who did not want to be homeless. They did not have any means of supporting themselves. No jobs, no place to live. But it was a terrible Bible study. Uh, every time I was there, the television would be on. They would do drugs, they smoked alcohol. They didn't get anything out of it. But God was doing something amazing upstairs. Laura, Charles, and Kim, a few months later, got baptized. And then Laura started her own Bible study, and she invited her neighbor, Dee. Dee invited her husband, Ken, to come, and then she invited another neighbor by the name of Terry. A few months later, all of them got baptized. And I go every week to try to study the Bible with Ty and Sue. Nothing goes through. Nothing. So one day I got upset with them. I got angry with them. I said, look at you. You're wasting your lives. You're sitting over here. You don't do anything. You don't contribute to society. You don't... Uh, Study, you don't work, just watch television all the time. And yet God has a better plan for your lives. And I read for them Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope and a better future. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And I left. I calmed down, came back the following week. There were four of them. That was the first time we ever had a Bible study. They brought their friends, Edgar and Terry, to come to the Bible study. A few months later, all four of them got baptized. This guy is Ty Gibson. How many of you know Ty Gibson? This is Ty Gibson. And he came to Andrews University two years ago in November. And he told this story in the first Sabbath he was there. And he made me famous all over the campus. <laughs> and it lasted only two days. <laughs> and then I went back again to being my son. As a result of this, 21 people got baptized. The Bible has a special word for it. In the Greek, it's called oikos. In the King James Bible, it's translated household. Uh, another word for it is web of relationship or web of evangelism. That's how the gospel is spread, through relationship, web. Uh, a woman invite her son and daughter, invite the neighbor, the neighbor invite the husband, another neighbor, and that is how the gospel is. Mm. Your mom and dad told you about the gospel. You share it with somebody else. This is the most effective means of advancing the kingdom of God. Amen. So turn to somebody next to you now. 
share with them, what are you going to do with this information? <laughs> and let's take just two minutes. It should be very easy, really. What are you going to do with this information? Help us to be used by you to bless the life of other people. And as we bless their life, ours will be blessed. Lead us to someone we can share Jesus with. We're starting a new year very, very soon. Lord, give us our five that we could bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen.